very good morning to all of you. Um, I'm Ryan. Today I'm going to share with you um, decontamination methods and classes of disinfectants. I'm sure all of you could be very interested to know what classes of disinfectants there are in the market. So let's start. Can you guys see the screen? Hi, Ryan. Yeah, we can see the screen. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So let's start. So um, there are many definitions of uh, disinfectants classifications. And even for definition for sanitizer and disinfectants, various regulatory bodies have different definition. And today I'm going to touch on the US EPA. Uh, for those who don't know, US EPA is the United States Environmental Protection Agency. It is an agency, perhaps a sister agency to FDA. I think more people are aware of FDA and then EPA. EPA is the agency that regulates and registers surface disinfectants, or to them it's called the antimicrobial pesticides, okay? So um, in EPA definition, sanitizer is actually a substance or mixture of substances that reduces the bacterial population in the inanimate environment by significant numbers, but it does not destroy all bacteria. And usually under the US EPA regulation, it is not necessary to have any uh, virucidal claims for sanitizer. However, for disinfectant, it is a substance or mixture of substances that destroys or irreversibly inactivates bacteria, fungi, and viruses, but not necessarily bacteria spores in the inanimate environment. So the difference between this is very um, thin. And usually some disinfectants also have sanitizer claims. And sanitizer in the US context is usually used in the food manufacturing industries where the US FDA require the manufacturing plants to sanitize the equipment before production of food. So in terms of this, there is a very slight difference in definition, okay? So, and on the label for e US EPA registered products, and it is clearly shown on the label, okay? However, for different countries, like I'm comparing US, Europe, and even Australia. In the US, a disinfectant has a greater antimicrobial activity than a sanitizer. But in Europe, there's no, sim there's no differentiation between a disinfectant and a sanitizer, okay? A disinfectant, in Europe, a disinfectant can have similar level of activity to a US sanitizer. So the standards are different, the definitions are different. In Australia, the term disinfectant is normally reserved for therapeutic goods, while the sanitizer term is normally used for food processing applications. But it is safe to say a sanitizer is a chemical uses on inanimate surfaces to reduce the microbial population to a safe level. All right, in food processing industry, this is very important. And further to that, US EPA disinfectants classification, it's usually divided into three levels. First level would be low level disinfection. Low level disinfection kills most vegetative bacteria, some viruses and some fungi, but cannot be relied on to kill mycobacteria or bacterial spores. Okay, on the second level, it is the intermediate level disinfection. It kills vegetative bacteria, most viruses and most fungi but does not reliably kill bacterial spores. And usually in intermediate level disinfe disinfections, there's also a mycobacterial cytal. 
that means it kills tuber tuberculosis, tuberculosis bacteria. And on higher level, it's called high level disinfection. High level disinfection or HLD completely eliminates all microorganisms except for a small number of bacteria spores. So what is the importance of the different level of dis differentiation? The importance for setting aside different levels of uh, disinfection is more towards healthcare settings. Because low level disinfectants usually are used for non-critical equipment. While intermediate level disinfection can be used for uh, uh, disinfections of higher level where there's a need to kill tuberculosidal bacteria. Well, the high level disinfectants is usually used to process um, critical medical equipment, usually that are inserted into the body and it needs to have a certain level of assurance in disinfection. Okay. And this is a pyramid, a general guideline for surface disinfectants and alcohols. As you can see, there's a generally a different categories of disinfectants, right? It's divided into non sporicidal disinfectants and sterilants. Okay, the higher it goes, the better the efficiency in the biocidal activity. Okay, occupying the low level, which is what you call the low level disinfectants, are the quartz, quaternary ammonium compounds. This is widely used everywhere in, in most industries. And on the, uh, in the middle of the pyramid is the phenols. Phenols has a long history of used in medical industry. Um, it is not as widely available as quaternary ammonium compounds, uh, maybe due to its uh, protoplasmic poison properties. All right. On the other end of the pyramid is the alcohol. Alcohol is, um, is a very rapid acting disinfectant. All right. Although in some regulations, they are not considered especially in US EPA, if they're not considered as uh, disinfectants. But in fact, alcohol at a high concentration, usually about 60 to 90%, it is mycobacterial cidal, right? So it is useful in the fight for infection control in any settings. And on top of the pyramid, it is what we call the sterilants or sporocytes, okay? Certain sporocytes are not sterilants, but sterilants are always sporocytal. Okay, this is the pyramid, a very useful chart to refer to. And in relation to that chart, we also have a hierarchy of susceptibility. This is the chart for, to show all the virus, how hard to kill a microorganism. Occupying the bottom of the chart is the enveloped virus. Enveloped virus are things like coronavirus, distemper, herpes, influenza, the common cold, common flu, occupies the environment, enveloped viruses. All right, basically there are a structure of a lipid membrane on the enveloped viruses and they are easiest to kill. Going up would be the vegetative bacteria, the salmonella, the pseudonomus, the E. coli, are the vegetative bacteria. All right. These are the second easiest to kill. And going up would be the fungi. The fungi like aspergillus, candida, are relatively easier to kill. Alcohol could kill it. Occupying above fungi will be the non-enveloped viruses and mycobacteria. Uh, these viruses and bacteria are known to be quite difficult to kill, right? And it depends on the formulation of the disinfectants. Certain non-virus are not killed by the disinfectants at all. 
okay? And even though we see less cases of microbacteria, like uh, tuberculosidal, tuberculosis cases, but according to my experience, we still see that, especially when you have an uh, influx of foreign laborers, who, are not, uh, who, are, who have a higher chances of contracting tu tuberculosis. All right. In fact, the other day, my customer was asking me, do I have a disinfectants that kill tuberculosis? Because one of the foreign workers has contracted this disease and they need to disinfect the whole factory. And occupying above on the top of the pyramid would be protozoa with cysts and bacterial spores. These are the hardest to kill because bacterial spores have a hard shell outer. Right, that is very difficult to penetrate by common disinfectants. So, this is the hierarchy that you, you should have in mind. All right, especially people are lumped together, non-enveloped virus and enveloped viruses. Right, you have, people have to understand that um, enveloped viruses are very easy to kill. Right, non-enveloped viruses are relatively much more difficult to kill. So going back to the pyramid of the uh, disinfectants, the, the most common one are alcohols, right? When we talk about alcohol, we are actually referring to ethyl alcohol and isopropyl alcohol. Ethyl alcohol has another name which is called ethanol and iso isopropyl alcohol in short is called IPA, right? These alcohols are rapidly bactericidal rather than bacteriostatic against vegetative forms of bacteria. There are also tuberculocidal, fungicidal, and virucidal, but they are not sporicidal, okay? But a very important point for alcohols is their cidal activity drops sharply when diluted below 50%. So the ideal concentration in any case would be at 60%, to 90% solutions in water. And then it's volume by volume, okay? It does not go by weight because alcohol is much lighter than water, okay? If you're gonna buy a one liter alcohol, it's not gonna, it's not gonna weigh one, one kilogram, okay? It's gonna weigh like 800 gram because it's a, a much lighter liquid. So volume by volume, the ideal optimum concentration is 60% to 90%. Right. Most of the manufacturers would stick to 70% because that's according to some studies, this is the optimum concentration where it is the fastest acting. So it does not mean that the higher it is, the better. Once it reaches 95%, it is a dehydrating agent and it is not as effective as 70% solution. So bear in mind, if you are buying a 99% alcohol, you might want to dilute with water until it is 70% concentration. So the advantage of alcohols is um, it does not leave residues, at least for those that are US pharmacopoeial grade, right? The higher the grade, the less um, contaminants they are, all right? But if you were to buy in the technical grade or industrial grade, then it is largely unfiltered, right? So there is a risk that this unfiltered alcohol could harbor some bacterial spores. Remember that alcohol does not kill spores. So actually the bacterial spores will actually survive in that alcohol if it's unfiltered. All right, advantages of, another advantage is alcohols are rapidly uh, bactericidal, right? So you can rely on alcohol to kill the bacteria in 30 seconds to one minute to a safe level, all right? For lipid viruses, okay? For non enveloped virus, maybe you want to live longer, like three minutes, until you can kill the virus. Okay? Another advantage is also alcohol. Um, the exposure limit is quite high. So there is less tendency of you being intoxicated by just breathing in. Okay? I don't mean by drinking it, but by breathing in. So. The, the limit set by the NIOSH, which is a US governmental uh, organization, which is the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, 
has set a rather high limit for alcohol, right? So also alcohol is widely available, okay? And is recommended by WHO for infection control of coronavirus. However, for every, every chemical, there's always uh, advantage and disadvantages. So for alcohol, the shortcomings are, it is very drying. They damage the shellac mountings of lens instruments. So if you have sensitive instruments lying around in your area, when you're disinfecting, you might want to take note of that. And it is not friendly to rubber and plastic tubings, right? Of course, if you use it once in a while, it is still okay. But if you use it regularly and in prolonged period, it will tend to swell and harden rubber and certain plastic tubing. And you also bleach rubber actually and plastic towels. And even if it's not very friendly to wooden furnitures, okay, and leathers, okay. Leathers are like our skin. For repeated use of alcohol, you find your skin very dry and quite itchy because it actually dries up the, the oils, natural oils that is present on leathers. So the same for leather furniture, you might not want to use alcohol to disinfect. Another shortcoming of alcohol is it is extremely flammable, okay? Um, it might present a storage problem, right? Perhaps you will, you will store one or two liters, it is okay at home. But if for commercial purposes, if you are buying a lot of alcohol, then it is considered a hazardous goods, okay? Another shortcoming of alcohol is because it is quite costly. Just like, unlike most disinfectants, alcohols, you need to use 60 to 70% at the optimum level. And that is a lot of alcohol you need to use, okay? And a very important, point is it is not suitable for fogging or misting, right? Because when you saturate the environment with alcohol, it presents a real fire hazard for alcohol, okay? I think initially um, when pandemic was announced, people were panicking and they were buying lots of alcohol to disinfect. Um, we don't knowing that this actually presents a fire hazard. And thank goodness, nothing had, bad had happened, all right? But if there is a fire source or heat source, it could potentially burn the whole house down if you are saturating the air with alcohol. The next category of um, commonly used disinfectants, uh, bear in mind the disinfectants that I'm going through are the commonly used ones. There are more choices right? and some, some are very new but less understood, okay? What I'm going through is the commonly used disinfectants classes, all right? Chlorine and chlorine compounds disinfectants is a big family, but the most commonly used one is the hypochlorite, all right? Commonly, commercial name is Clorox, okay? Even though Clorox has different chemistry also, but mostly they are known for their bleach, right? Sodium hypochlorite. Okay, so sodium hypochlorite are the most widely used of chlorine disinfectants. It is available as liquid or solid, all right? Calcium hypochlorite. In a solid form, it is mostly used in disinfecting swimming pools and uh, things like that. Usually present in aqueous solutions of 5.25% to 6.15% and it's usually called household bleach, right? The good thing about bleach, uh, bleach is they have a broad spectrum of antimicrobial activity. Does not leave toxic residue, are unaffected by water hardness, and it is quite relatively inexpensive and fast acting. Okay, and there is very little incidences of serious toxicity, even though it's quite toxic in a sense, but you hear very few cases of people getting intoxicated by bleach. So advantages of chlorine-based product is it is widely available and cheap. So the cost factor is that it is fast acting and broad spectrum efficacy. It has a relatively safe profile. 
although I wouldn't say it's very safe, right? Kids shouldn't be touching it. And water hardness does not affect the efficacy. Okay. In in Southeast Asia, I don't think water hardness is ever an issue. But in the West, uh, water are uh, because of the sources of water, water can be hard, right? That means it can be alkaline. So for shortcomings of chlorine-based disinfectants, um, bleach, as we all know, can cause ocular irritation or oral pharyngeal, esophageal, and gastric burns. Okay, it can irritate your eyes and your throat. And bleach is actually quite corrosive to metals, even to stainless steel. Okay, because bleach will actually attack stainless steel. Okay, for prolonged use, you'll find your stainless steel will begin to rust. Right, it's completely uh, go against your common belief that stainless steel will not rust. Stainless steel will rust because the hypochlorite will attack this, the, the, the surface, what we call the chromium oxide layer of the stainless steel. Okay, and bleach is very easily deactivated by organic matter. Right, let's say you have um, proteinaceous residues, blood, or anything on the surface. When you use bleach, it actually will deactivate the effect of the bleach. Okay. And bleach, as we all know, is used to uh, whiten or bleach fabrics and all that. So it is not so um, suitable to be used on fabrics because it will tend to bleach permanently the fabrics. And also, because of the chlorine content, when it mixed with ammonia or acid, bleach will release very toxic gas okay so be careful of that and it is quite quite unstable actually for bleach and i'm not sure who actually uses bleach for fogging application but i personally don't recommend using it and bleach is quite easily affected by ph okay Example of chlorine-based disinfectants are Clorox, right? The commercial name for sodium hypochlorite. And commercially, there's also another um, chlorine-based disinfectant, what we call the SDCC. It's usually mixed on the spot. It comes in powder form or tablet forms, okay? These are used quite widely in hospitals. It has a better um, chemical stability than common bleach. Another one is the super oxidized water. Uh, it's basically using water and common salt, table salt, and run an electric current through it to produce a hypochlorous acid. Right? Hypochlorous acid in this form is actually quite um, unstable. Right? It has a very short shelf life. So commercially, they are available with a one-year shelf life. But um, it is still a very unstable, um, unstable chemistry. Another one would be the chlorine dioxide taps. Um, you need to mix on-site. It is also highly unstable, but efficacious and has a short shelf life. Next, we go to another class of the uh, disinfectants. Quite commonly seen, but not as common as bleach. It's called the hydrogen peroxide. Uh, commercially, it usually comes in 3% to 7.5% solution in our opaque glass bottles. As a household cleaner, it is also an effective disinfectant that will kill viruses, bacteria, and molds. And at 6%, Hydrogen peroxide can be a sporicide. Okay. So hydrogen peroxide, the mode of action of hydrogen peroxide is such that it produces a destructive hydrosyl free radicals that can attack membrane lipids, DNA, and other essential self components. 
catalase produced by aerobic organisms and facultative anaerobes that possess cytochrome systems can protect cells from metabolic, metabolically produced hydrogen peroxide by degrading hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. Okay, however, that's, a, that's to say certain cells and mycobacteria can actually uh, neutralize the attack by hydrogen peroxide, but they can only neutralize to a certain extent. If you use a high enough concentration of hydrogen peroxide, this mechanism, defense mechanism, is usually overwhelmed. Okay, so sufficient concentration of hydrogen peroxide need to be used, right? So the way how hydrogen peroxide is actually producing a radical, a free radical, some of you might have heard of what free radical is. In terms of this case, the free radical with hydroxyl radicals that actually oxidizes the cell membranes of uh, microorganisms. The advantages of hydrogen peroxide is um, it breaks down into water and oxygen. So in terms of residues, some, some customers might be concerned on what kind of residues, what toxic residues are there after usage. Hydrogen peroxide is ideal because it only releases into water and oxygen. And US EPA has classed this as a green alternative for disinfectants. It has a relatively stable shelf life as well. Right? Hydrogen peroxide is relatively stable in when it is in the packaging, in the, in the opaque packaging. The shortcomings of hydrogen peroxide at 6% is a bleaching agent, right? Often used at the hair salons for dyeing hair, okay? So if you're going to use 6% or 5% in Europe, anything higher than 5% is considered toxic and it needs to be appear on the label, okay? So if you're going to consider using 6% and 6 hydrogen peroxide, there is potential that you're going to bleach the surroundings, right? And hydrogen peroxide can cause eye and skin irritation when exposed. And it is also cytotoxic. That means it is toxic to the cells, right? In the past, hydrogen peroxide is used by doctors to uh, disinfect wounds, open wounds and all that. But uh, nowadays, it's been discouraged because they found that uh, it is cytotoxic. They actually kill the cells on the wounds, the cells around, the skin cells surrounding the wounds. And healing, after you heal, it, it looks really ugly because the cells are all dead around it, right? So nowadays, doctors don't use hydrogen peroxide to disinfect your wounds. They are better alternatives. Um, another hydrogen peroxide disadvantage is it has a short-term exposure of 75 ppm so um, if you're going to do misting in your on-site, uh, preferably no one is present when doing the misting, right? Because if you're going to, because you could easily reach the 15 minutes exposure time, right? If you're saturating the, the whole environment with hydrogen peroxide, right? And hydrogen peroxide, you need to use a relatively high concentration to be efficacious, okay? There are cases where hydrogen peroxide are um, are used at thirty five percent concentration, right? That, but that is to kill to have a sterilant effect, okay. And of course, I've mentioned before, hydrogen peroxide is actually a bleaching agent, so you bleach your fabrics and furniture. So you will see those bleach the advertisers to be uh, a non-chlorine-based a non bleach. It usually means it's made of hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so another category is the parasitic acid and hydrogen peroxide. Um, this is a mixture of parasitic acid and hydrogen peroxide, right? It is a broad spectrum um, disinfectant. Again, it decomposes into water and oxygen, and in some cases, some acidic acid. 
It remains effective in the presence of organic matter and is sporicidal even at low temperatures. Right, broad spectrum kill in 10 minutes. And Festeris, it is one of the products and is passed as a sterilin by the US EPA. Right? There are only a few products that are approved by USDA as a sterilin. Right? I think it's along five in the market. Okay? And this formulation is approved as a sterilin. A sterilin is um, the ability to kill spores to a factor of six log reduction right, in a specific time. Okay. The mode of action for what we call the PAA and hydrogen peroxide is that it denatures proteins, disrupts cells, and oxidizes sulfhydro and sulfur bonds and proteins and enzymes and other metabolites. Okay. Below you can see the picture of denatur denaturation. So this is how they kill the thing. Okay. So the shortcomings of parasitic acid and hydrogen peroxide. Um, it might swell and damage certain polymeric substances during prolonged soaking. And it has a very strong smell, all right? Almost like vinegar, all right? So when doing fogging, um, preferably the personnel is not in the room or you wear a high level PPE and respirator, okay? Because this is a very strong chemistry. Next, we go to the glutaroidehyde. Uh, glutaroidehyde is also a um, sporicide at a certain pH. It's actually a saturated dye or dehyde that has gained white acceptance as high level disinfectant and chemical sterilant. Okay, the aqueous solutions of glutaroidehyde is are acidic and generally in this state are not sporicidal. Only when the solution is activated, made alkaline by use of alkalinating agents to a pH of 7.5-8.5 does the solution become sporicidal. So again, you, from there you can tell that uh, glutaroidehyde is highly affected by its pH level in its sporicidal activity. Okay, Once activated, this solution has a shelf life of 14 days. So glutaroidehyde traditionally needs to be activated by an alkali solution. And it, once alkaline, it has 14 days shelf life, okay? Because once go on, when you keep on using it, that there's a process called polymerization. So the shortcomings of glutaroidehyde is chronic exposure can result in skin irritation or dermatitis, mucous membrane irritation in terms of uh, eye, nose, or mouth or worse still, pulmonary symptoms, right? It can also cause asthma and rhinitis, right? Um, but in the commercial settings, only healthcare settings, you see a lot of people using uh, glutaraldehyde. But we also see it used in Malaysia quite widely. Uh, one of the mixture for poultry and swine farm workers, when this chemical is extensively used as a misting chemical, okay? But bear in mind that OSHA limit is 0 0.05 ppm exposure, okay? Beyond that, you can irritate eyes, throat, and mucous membrane, okay? But I don't think, I, I think I've seen one service provider using glutaraldehyde to do misting and uh, disinfecting service. Um, yeah, we'll go about that later on, what I think about it. The next category is what we call the phenolics. Okay, 
Uh, phenol has occupied a prominent place in the field of hospital disinfection since its initial use as a germicide by Lister and its pioneering work on antiseptic surgery. In the past 30 years, however, work has concentrated on the numerous phenol derivatives of phenolics and their antimicrobial properties. Two phenol derivatives commonly found as constituents of hospital disinfectants are orthophenolphenol and orthobenzylpyrochlorophenol. Uh, phenols are virucidal, bactericidal, microbactericidal, and fungicidal. So it occupies, if you remember the pyramid that I talked about, it occupies the, in the middle layer, what we call the intermediate level disinfectants, uh, basically because it is microbactericidal. Okay. Why it's important to differentiate between low and intermediate is because uh, if you, are, you have a mycobacteriocidal claim, then you tend to be able to kill non-enveloped virus as well. Okay? Non-enveloped virus like norovirus, rotavirus are commonly found viruses that can cause diarrhea and vomiting. And it's quite common in like cruise ship where there's always an outbreak of such viruses. And once it's outbreak, everyone seems to get it. So the advantages of phenolics is it is a broad spectrum efficacy. It has mycobactericidal claim. As I mentioned before, it's likely to be fully virucidal. It has it kills non-enveloped and enveloped viruses. It is fast acting and a non-oxidizing chemistry. Right? Being non-oxidizing also means that it has good material compatibility. Okay? And good material compatibility is very important when you're using it. Right? It's one of the practical considerations when you're trying to use uh, chemistry to disinfect. But there are shortcomings as well. You know? uh, phenolics are, in the US, they cannot be used on infant bassinets. Okay, because it can cause a certain disease in infant and it is not sporicidal. Okay, on cases where in hospital settings, uh, we have a C. difficile spores outbreak, then it's not recommended to use phenolics. And another shortcoming is it needs to be disposed of carefully, right, according to MSDS. Right, the next section we're going to talk about is the widely used quaternary ammonium compounds. Right, QACs, in short, it is active ingredient in over 200 disinfectants, currently recommended by the US EPA for use to, to inactivate the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 virus. Okay? Um, and interestingly, QACs, there are many generations of QACs, ranging from benzyl chromium chloride, or what we call BAC, which is the first generation, to the DDAC, the fourth generation, what we call the twin chain QACs. All right? With each subsequent newer generations offering a, a largely better biocidal efficacy and safety profile. So basically, they are up to now, what I read in the literature is there are seventh generation of QACs, okay? But you still see a lot of people using uh, benzyl chromium chloride, right? Even though there are better choices of QAC when, when doing disinfections. The advantages of QACs um, it has a broad spectrum efficacy. Okay, uh, it is highly fungicidal. Okay, uh, somewhat virucidal and bactericidal, and can kill algae and protozoa as well. Okay, it is widely used as a fungicide. The safety profile of QAC is well known. Right, um, usually is better than most dis disinfectants especially the fourth and fifth generation QACs, okay? Because um, the efficacy is a lot better than first generation. That's why you need to use less of it. And that's why the safety profile becomes better, 
okay and also it has a very excellent material compatibility right does not does not affect your leather your plastics your aluminium those 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 things are easily corroded by an oxidizing chemistry and it is highly stable right compared to oxidizing chemistry like bleach and hydrogen peroxide okay and also another good property of qac is it has a good detergency okay so it has a very soapy kind of feeling right because in in terms of disinfection we always tell people you need to clean before you disinfect okay cleaning could mean you use soap and water to to clean off the surface then you disinfect with a with a disinfectant um, in a lot of cases qac you can use like a two in one shampoo right with good detergency you can just use it on the spot you can clean and disinfect at the same time okay and in terms of um, odor it is unlike chlorine based disinfectants and um, a parasitic acid which has a very strong smell some people just hate this kind of smell and qac smell is pretty neutral right so this is the disadvantage of qacs and um, is widely used in the industry. Okay. Anyway, okay. Okay, the shortcomings of QACs. QACs might not be tuberculosidal. All right, although it's not a huge concern in everyday setting, but it is a concern in a healthcare setting. And um, um, should I say, because of uh, influx of foreign foreigners in our country, tuberculosis, sites, tuberculosis seems to make a comeback, right? It, it's been unheard of for so many years, but it seems to be able to make a comeback. So uh, it's an important quality to have, right, for disinfectants. But QAC, certain types of QACs, especially fourth and fifth generations, when added with a, a small amount of alcohol, can actually be tu tuberculosidal, okay? And our shortcomings of QAC refers to the benzyl chromium chloride, right? It has a lower biocidal efficacy, okay? And can get deactivated by organic matter, especially cotton mops, right? So be careful what kind of cleaning tools you use when cleaning, right? Uh, preferably not a cotton wipe or cotton mop, because this could actually absorb the active ingredient in the disinfectant solution that contains uh, quaternary ammonium compounds, especially a, a first generation one, which has a lower biocidal activity than the fourth or fifth generation. Right? Um, I think we're going to take some questions and answers. And I'm going to take a short break so that uh, I'll continue on the second part. And if there's any question, you can post on the Q&A and I'll answer it. And after that, there'll be, a, I think, a 10 minutes break. Chris? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Brian. Okay, we have two questions in the Q&A box right now. So I'll try to uh, read out the questions as best as I can. Okay, um, so we have a question here from uh, Mr. Aziz. Uh, so he's asking, uh, can you name any disinfectant that can be used uh, for thermal fogging or hot fogging? Um, yeah. So, yeah, thermal fogging and hot fogging. He's asking if you can name any disinfectant. Uh, and okay, let me uh, assist uh, here. Uh, what he meant is uh, thermal fogging and hot fogging is a uh, toast uh, like you see external compound when be the service provider provide the mosquito fogging, the one with the foggy type. Yeah, it's not the, for the internal. He's asking for external thermal fogging. Um, I think it, there is a very um, important concept you should know about disinfection. Uh, thermal fogging is largely used to actually fog out the mosquitoes or insects or whatever. Right? The action is 
but um, or mosquitoes can fly in the air, right? So you actually fog it and kill it. Disinfectants are mostly used on hard surfaces, right? There's been scientific studies saying that if you disinfect the air, it's not going to work. So a lot of disinfectants are for coal use or, or ULV use, okay? So it is not recommended to be used as a thermal fogging. Okay, because you do not really want to create a smoke. But what you want to achieve is create a mist, a small water droplet that could land on surfaces for a certain amount of time to kill the bacteria. Okay, it's unlikely you'll find bacteria floating in the air everywhere. Okay, um, it might happen in a very crowded place, but in open air, um, it's unlikely. Okay. Do I answer the question? Okay, I, I think that should be fine. And um, okay, there's two other questions here. Um, so there's a question from Mr. Muhammad Hasib. Uh, so he's asking, uh, which sanitizer, uh, for which sanitizer, the which formulation of sanitizer is better, uh, liquid or gel based? I think it depends on your preference. As long as it kills the, dis the microbes, I think the, the, the one that kills the most microbes is the better one, All right? The, 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 the delivery, the, the way it's being delivered is, um, does not affect which is better, right? More importantly is the formulation. Okay. But you were talking about 75% alcohol, in a hand sanitizer setting, then as long as it's seventy five percent and shown to have that kind of concentration, liquid and gel both work. I've not seen a gel based uh, non alcohol disinfectant. So. Okay, all right. Thank you, Maybe right? I have, but uh, like benzyl chromium chloride, as long as it works, right? Right. Okay. Um. Thank you. So we have one final question before we go to break. So this question again is from Mister Aziz. He's asking why is isopropyl alcohol recommended in food processing areas compared to other alcohol-based products? Um, like I said, there's basically just two types of alcohol, the IPA, which is isopropyl alcohol and ethyl alcohol. Um, in Malaysia, so I think perhaps it has more to do with um, the plant being halal. So, Ethyl alcohol is also used in hard liquor and all that. So they try to avoid using ethyl alcohol while IPA, while IPA is not drinkable, right? Right. Both works, right? Okay. Um, and don't, don't ever use methanol or methyl alcohol. It's highly toxic and has very low cidal activity. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, thank you. I think that's about it for now for questions. Uh, for the, to the rest of the uh, audience, if you have any questions, just post them uh, into the Q&A box. Uh, we will I think answer. we have one more, right? Yeah. Uh, one more just came in. Um, yeah, if you want to answer it now before we go to break, that'd be good. Sure. Okay. Um, so there is a question from Mr. Azahari. Uh, so he's asking, for COVID-19, uh, which... Uh, which is more effective in office environments, uh, disinfection, uh, fogging or spray and wipe? So he's talking about uh, in office environment, when you're disinfecting in office, uh, what, what, which is uh, more effective, I think. Uh, is it fogging or spraying and wiping? I think uh, we are achieving the same objective. Really is to, to uh, eliminate any microbacterial uh, microorganisms on surfaces. Um, if your office is small, you know you can manage it. Then spray and wipe. If your office is huge, then spray and wipe is very tedious work, right? And certain corners you cannot possibly reach by hand, and that's why you do fogging or misting, right? When you're doing fogging, your purpose is just to ensure there is enough layer of disinfectants on hard surfaces. When you do fogging, you're not, you are never 
to fog the air. All right, it is a futile attempt to kill the bacterium because most viruses will lie, will, will rest on hard surfaces. So it's really, you are really trying to achieve the same objective. Okay, you are, um, it's not recommended to saturate the whole environment with disinfectants anyway. Right, okay. Uh, well, there's one final question, I guess maybe you answer that, we will go to break. So uh, Michelle is asking, uh, which ingredient is best uh, for COVID-19 disinfection? Um, best. Uh, depending on your objective, what is considered best? It's just convenient, easy to use, you know. Um, the, the, the disinfectants that I've gone through just now are all can be used, okay, at the right concentration and according to the label, okay. Mm, for small areas, you know, if you have alcohol spray, use it, right. It's also my favorite because it basically does not leave a lot of residues, right. So I'm, I'm, I have a peace of mind when you have young kids at home, you know, because the alcohol will just evaporate. Okay, and if you're not familiar with those other chemicals on the market, then you stick to alcohol. But for disinfectant service is another another consideration. As I pointed out, alcohol cannot be misted so much because it's a fire hazard and highly flammable. So all the ingredients, all the classes of disinfectants that I pointed out are good for COVID-19 because it is a and violet virus occupying at the bottom of the pyramid. So it's pretty easy to kill. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Ryan. Okay, everyone, we're going to take a 10 minute break. So the time now on my clock is 10.54. So please come back at about 11.05 uh, to continue the session. Um, okay, thank you everyone. Yep.
Hi, uh, good morning again, everyone. So we've already reached the end of our 10 minute break. Um, so we will continue today's session. Um, so I would like to invite uh, Mr. Ryan back uh, to continue uh, the second half of today's session on uh, disinfectant classes and decontamination methods, a practical approach. So uh, Mr. Ryan, uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Chris. Uh, can you allow me to share screen? Okay. Okay, let us continue on. Um, now we reach a, a part where practical part of it. Okay. In the previous part, I talked about disinfectants and the various properties and uh, the advantages and the shortcomings. So when you're selecting a disinfectant, there are various practical considerations you need to consider before you choose one. Because the first one, of course, has always been the product efficacy. Then how do we know a product is efficacious? Okay. The least you can do is at least the product is registered with a reputable regulatory body. Preferably a US EPA, or if you're from a Europe one, uh, that conforms with the Biocider Product Regulation of the ECHA. Okay, and I understand that certain products are made locally and they're not registered with US EPA or Biocider Product Regulation, BPR. Uh, at least you have some third party independent lab testing following established standards like AOAC or EN standards. Right, EN standards, there are various EN standards. Right, the EN 13697 is the carrier test for bacteria. And the EN 14476 is a suspension test for virus. Okay, all these standards, at least you have a reference point to know whether one product is good or not. Okay, uh, I see a lot in the market that claims that this ingredient is approved by Singapore NEA and so therefore my product is good, right? When the ingredient is approved by NEA it does not mean that your product is good because you have not shown an efficacy. There's no third party independent test to say that your product actually does what it claims to do, right? Which is what uh, registration with it with a regulatory, regulatory body does, right? Because when you say you, you, your product does this, does that, then the regulatory body will actually review your data and ask you questions to prove it, okay? So be very careful because there's a risk that the product on the market might not be actually past the, the biocidal testing, right? Mainly because they are fly-by-night companies that mixes their ingredients in a workshop and you know they don't really know the formulation and of course um, they, are, they have no QC. Okay, another consideration which is very important in the concept of disinfectancy is um, having a realistic contact times. Okay, Ideally, the disinfectant will stay wet and in contact with the pathogen for at least as long or longer than the contact time listed on its label. So what it means is it is okay to stay longer than what the label says, but it's not okay to stay shorter than what the label, label claims to kill. Okay? Unfortunately, many disinfectants dry before the contact time is achieved. Okay, especially those with long contact times or high levels of alcohol. Okay, so another shortcomings of alcohol is that um, maybe you need five minutes contact time. That means the surface is wet. Contact time is means the surface is filled with the disinfectants and it's not dry. Okay, once it's dry, it's not considered contact time anymore. Okay, don't have the wrong concept. Okay, so. What if you use a high, high level of alcohol of disinfectants? That means you actually, if you want to achieve the five minutes contact time, 
you actually have to reapply the alcohol again and again and again to make sure it reaches the five minutes contact time. Okay, and also, um, of course, you would choose uh, disinfectants that is shorter contact time. You know, most con most disinfectants have like ten minutes. Okay, of course, you have five minutes is better, right? It's easier. Some have three minutes. You know, you, you choose a shorter contact time um, disinfectants because it's realistic. Because people tend to spray and wipe, spray and wipe, which is a wrong application. Okay, another consideration, point of consideration, is good material compatibility. Okay, facility furnishings and equipment can be expensive. Okay, especially PCOs when you when you have contract with the big companies, um, you know, even IT companies, they have huge servers and whatever. Uh, these are very expensive equipment. Okay, you have to make sure your disinfectants are actually compatible with the material. Okay, some disinfectants can harm surfaces or shorten the useful life of these assets. Okay, you have to have an understanding of disinfectants compatibility. Okay, and usually on the market, the commercial disinfectants, they don't produce a material compatibility study. Okay? Unless it comes from a very established company, they will give you a material compatibility sheet. Okay? And if they have it, that is great. Right? It is indicator that this product has got some quality. Right? And it can test the product up to extreme conditions. Right? Like for steroids, they would soak the material for for seven days, seven full days, even though practically you don't actually soak it. But this is extreme case and it's going to tell you whether it is still compatible with the material or not. Okay, and a point to take is most oxidizing chemistries like chlorine-based disinfectants uh, have less material compatibility than those non-oxidizing ones. Okay, that's a point to take when selecting disinfectants. And of course, the compatibility with cleaning tools. Some cleaning tools um, like mops, you know, wipes, uh, can actually inhibit the effectiveness of a disinfectant. For instance, uh, a cotton cleaning tools can bind with a QAC. Okay, especially the first generation BAC, which is the benzyl chromium chloride, which is widely used, right? And it actually absorbs the active ingredient on the surface. And the biocidal activity of the disinfectants is decreased. Okay. So you could be saying, oh, I follow the label instructions, what? But the fact is, even if you follow the label instruction, you're using the wrong tool. Okay. So for this facility should make sure disinfectants are compatible with the existing cleaning tools or purchase new tools that don't reduce the efficacy of the disinfectants. My opinion is um, try not to use any cotton-based or organic material to be used with the disinfectants. Okay? Even bleach can be reduced by cotton mops. Another consideration is the safety profile. Um, some disinfectants are irritating to eyes, irritating to skin, uh, even your respiratory tracts, and they may require the use of PPE, or they may just simply have a very strong smell, which is unpleasant. Once you have things that have very repulsive smell, then people will tend to use less of it, okay? Because they don't like it, okay? And because of that, this may cause staff to minimize the use of product and compromising results. A PCO should look for a disinfectant that's safer and more pleasant for staff to use, um, thereby reducing the potential of worker injuries and visitor and staff complaints. Right? If you're using bleach, um, uh, some people are very sensitive to bleach, so um, they don't like it. They feel uh, unpleasant. Okay. And if any doubts, you should refer to the product SDS for more details. 
Okay, so these are the CDC cleaning and disinfection guidelines, which I've extracted from the CDC website. CDC is a center for disease control of the USA. Okay, so when you're doing a cleaning and disinfection, uh, this plan and guideline might apply to PCOs who are doing disinfecting service. Right, first of all, you need to develop the plan. Right, determine what needs to be cleaned. Right. And CDC has recommended that um, areas unoccupied for seven or more days um, need only routine cleaning. All right? I mean, um, you probably don't need a major disinfecting service because that area is not occupied by humans for seven or more days. So the chances of it shedding viruses everywhere is uh, very minimal, okay? Because viruses will die by itself if it cannot find a host. A host is a living thing, could be animal or humans, okay? So you just maintain your normal cleaning procedures, right? A normal cleaning, you know, wiping with, with soap and all that. And the next step is determine how areas will be disinfected. Right. Consider the type of surface and how often the surface is touched. So we prioritize disinfecting frequently touched surfaces. Okay. Um, perhaps in different scenarios, right? For office settings, um, a staircase or a carpeted floors might not be touched by hands, right? and you probably don't need to disinfect that much. However, if you're disinfecting a, um, a nursery, a preschool, kids crawl on the floor all the time, and that is considered a high touch area already. Okay? So it depends on case by case, what is, the, what is called a high touch area, what is called a you know, low touch area, right? People seldom touch it. And you consider the resources and equipment needed, right? Keep in mind that the availability of cleaning products and PPE uh, that is appropriate for the cleaners and disinfectants, right? If you're going to do fogging, make sure you wear a coverall and a respirator. And for goodness sake, don't wear a tree ply mask, okay? It does not protect you from anything, at least the chemicals. So after determining the having a plan, then how are you going to implement it? Okay, you clean the visibly dirty surfaces with detergent prior to disinfection. Okay, it's it's very common sense. It's like we're washing washing dirty dishes. You usually rinse the plates and the dishes with water first, then you apply the detergent. Right. So it's it's the same. To clean dirty surfaces with detergent prior to disinfection. Because remember, I, I share about the um, chlorine based compounds. They are easily deactivated by organic matter. Okay? And use the appropriate cleaning or disinfection product. Use the EPA approved disinfectant against COVID 19 and read the label to make sure it meets your needs. Right. Um, this applies to US because US EPA approved the disinfectants against COVID-19, but in Malaysia, at least use a reputable brand one. Okay. That that um, if you are in doubt, you can use bleach or alcohol. Right. If you don't know which brand to go for, because there's very few US EPA uh, registered and approved product in the market in Southeast Asia, right? But they are, they are, right? If you look for it. And always follow the directions on the label, okay? The label includes safety information and applications instructions, okay? Um, when it says one, one part you mix water with 10 parts water, right? One part, one part concentrate you mix with 10 parts water, uh, make sure you follow the instruction and not mix one part concentrate with 100 parts water, that means it will not be effective. 
okay? And make sure to keep the disinfectants out of reach of children. Once you've done that, and cleaning and disinfection is a continuous process, right? You need to continue or revise your plan based upon appropriate disinfectants and PPE availability, right? The same, it's the same cycle again, right? Dirty surfaces should be cleaned with detergent prior to disinfection. Routinely disinfect frequently touched surfaces at least daily, okay? And maintain safe practices such as frequent hand washing, using face masks, and staying home if you are sick. So once you disinfect a, a whole room, it doesn't mean it is safe anymore because they are humans, right? Your office mates and all that. They come from different backgrounds and congregate in the office and they start touching surfaces, okay? And you, you never know. A, a disinfected surface is only as clean as the last touched, last clean session. Okay, once another person touch it, then there's a probability that it's been contaminated. Okay. Continue practices that reduce the potential for exposure. Right, it is very important. It doesn't mean you disinfect the surface, the whole office. It is good to mix and mingle around and be in close contact with your uh, humans. Right, you maintain. You still maintain the social distancing staying six feet away from others and don't share uh, frequently touched objects okay don't don't share your computers or um, tables or calculators you know, things like that so this is a flow chart of um, the flow chart of cleaning and disinfection okay when you're going about trying to clean and disinfect. So the first question is, is the area indoors? If it is not indoors, then maintain existing cleaning practices, right? Don't go about doing major disinfection outdoors, okay? Because coronaviruses naturally dies in hours, two days, in typical indoor and outdoor environments, okay? Viruses are killed more quickly by warmer temperatures and sunlight, okay? Remember, viruses need a host. When there's no host, it's like they're, they're living in the, in, in the wild forest, you know. They get killed pretty quickly. Okay, so um, people who are trying to disinfect outdoors uh, is doing a very futile attempt to kill the viruses because uh, there's no need to do that, okay? We need to disinfect an indoor area, okay? Once it is an indoor area, then you go to the next step. Has the area been occupied for the past seven days? Right. Bear in mind, this is a CDC guideline, eh? okay, which I extracted from the website. And no, if it's not occupied for the seven days, this area will only need routine cleaning, okay? That means it's unoccupied by humans for the last seven days. The probability if there is any viruses existing on the surfaces will die naturally okay? because they have no host to rely on for energy and all that. They'll die naturally. Okay? But if the area is um, occupied in the last seven days, then there's probably that the contamination, the viruses are still there and alive. Okay? The next question should be asked is, is it a frequently touched objects? If it's no, then thoroughly clean these materials. Consider setting a schedule for routine cleaning and disinfection as appropriate, right? However, if it's a frequently touched objects, you need to evaluate what kind of objects is that, right? Then you go to the next step. What type of materials are the surfaces? Right? If it's a hard, non-porous materials like glass, metal, or plastic, again, um, a visibly dirty surfaces should be cleaned prior to disinfection. You consult an EPA list of disinfectants to, for use against COVID-19, specifically for use on hard, non-porous surfaces or for a specific application need. And more frequent cleaning and disinfection is necessary to reduce exposure. 
and uh, soft, if, it's, if the materials are soft and porous materials like carpets, rugs, or material in sitting areas, you need to clean and launder the materials. You need to remove them and actually wash them up in a washing machine. And uh, try not to place all these carpets and all that in the high traffic areas, okay? Uh, because the the performance of disinfectants on hard non-porous material versus soft por porous materials are very different. It is easier to kill bacteria and microorganisms and viruses on hard and non-porous materials like glass, stainless steels and metals compared to fabrics and cloth or rugs, right? If you have that in a high traffic area like office area, try to remove them because they can harbor uh, nasty things there and disinfectants might not work as well on these surfaces. Okay, examples of high touch areas, um, doorknobs, switches, toilet seats, water taps, kitchen counters and tables, keychains, mobile phones, elevator buttons, computer keyboards, uh, escalator handrails, okay, uh, these are, because these are where your hands would normally touch and we all know the hands are very dirty, okay. And the concept of clean first, disinfect later. Um, clean first before you disinfect. Germs can hide underneath dirt and other materials on surfaces where they're not affected by the disinfectant. Dirt and organic material can also reduce the germ killing ability of some disinfectants, right? The analogy I always use is, you know, you always brush your teeth before you gargle with a mouth rinse. Okay, brushing the teeth is actually cleaning your teeth, right? And that's why you gargle afterwards, right? Are there any people who does it the other way around? Right? So if you're doing that, then you're doing it wrong, okay? You always brush your teeth and then you gargle to, to actually disinfect your mouth, okay? Um, this is my personal recommendation. It does not need to be have a 3M brand, right? Um, I, I believe uh, a synthetic fiber microfiber cloth is widely available nowadays. Okay, avoid cotton towels or rags for reasons I've uh, touched on before, because cotton rags would actually absorb. Because cotton, you, if you see the cotton structure, is actually a porous, a very porous material compared to synthetic fiber. Synthetic fiber, if you see, uh, is actually very rounded and very nice, perfect shape. It does not absorb anything. So cotton fiber has a lot of um, porous loops and holes that actually absorb all these active ingredients. Okay, so choose one good quality one, right? Microfiber, cloth, to clean off dirty surfaces, okay? Um, Make it a good practice to clean before you disinfect because certain certain uh, certain furniture you might not even visibly see is dirty, but when you wipe it, it's quite dirty. Okay, like, um, coffee tables, uh, handrails, all that. Right, make it a habit to clean first with a good microfiber cloth, and the action of wiping actually will reduce some um, microorganism. Right, because the, you're actually mechanically removing it and microfiber could actually catch on to those microorganisms. Right? Another good quality of microfiber, it would catch on the dirt and all that in the cloth. Okay? So it does not redeposit in other places if you're going to continue using the cloth. Okay, um, if you're going to do misting, um, a ULV fogger is preferred because thermal fogging will potentially degrade certain disinfectants. All right? A lot of these uh, disinfectants in the market are not designed for heating up. Right? Because thermal fogger actually heat up to a certain degree where it produces a lot of smoke. Okay? 
and because when you're doing fogging, you you are actually creating a mist, not a smoke. Right? Your purpose is to create a thin layer of mist so it can cover the area, the surfaces, and not the air. Okay. That's why a ULV fogger is a, it's a fine tool to do misting, right? Your whole purpose is not to saturate your air with a lot of mist, right? Because you're not really uh, trying to disinfect the air, okay? You're trying to spray at the objects and equipments and furniture with the thin layer of uh, chemicals, okay? Of course, if you can, you should just spray and wipe, right? But it's, that is a very tedious job. That's why people do fogging, okay? And again, um, the purpose of misting is not to disinfect the air. It is rather different concept than fogger, thermal fogging. Right? Thermal fogging is used to, as a pesticide to drive out the pest, right? When, when the pest... Uh, smell it, they'll die or, you know, being driven away. It's a diff totally different concept. And when doing fogging, you need to ensure you wear proper PPE, um, preferably a water-resistant coverall. I've seen people use uh, some SMS material, um, but preferably a Tyvek one with a respirator, okay? And not a three-ply mask. Uh, I've seen some advertisements, some big companies that sell um, water filters that offer disinfecting service as well, showing their guys wearing three-ply masks, okay? So uh, that's a big no-no, right? Because you are potentially in an area for longer than 15 minutes, right? If your chemical has a waiting a NIOSH rating, right, of certain PPM. If you wear the three-ply mask, you're going to potentially be breathing in because the, the mist and the smell is going to go through your three-ply mask, right? Your three-ply mask does not block this mist or smell. And if possible, if even if you're wearing a respirator, do not remain in the fog area for too long, okay? And do not spray the air, okay? You're not trying to disinfect the air, okay? You're trying to disinfect the objects and equipments and uh, ensuring that they're covered completely with disinfectants. And do not spray at sensitive IT equipments if not sure if the chemical that you're using will corrode or damage, all right? Instead, you just wipe down, okay? Because if, if you create a mist, it will go into the crevices and all that, inside the servers and all that. that, that, that that's not necessary, okay? Right. That will, it, will, it, will, it will destroy the internal electronics. Instead, you just um, wipe down the outer shell and all that. Right. Follow product label for contact dwell web time. Usually, it's 10 to 15 minutes, okay? Whatever the label says, okay? So, you leave it for 10 to 15, then you wipe down, okay? Wiping is a good practice, right? To remove the residues as well as the microorganisms, dead microorganisms, okay? And then we ventilate well thereafter, after the infection, disinfection site, right? Yeah. And I mentioned already, wipe down the surfaces if it remains visibly wet. Okay, so um, I think I'm on point. And this is... The end of my presentation. I'm gonna take some questions. Chris. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Okay, everyone. Um, uh, there's time for Q and A. So there are a few more questions that have um, come in. So I'll just read out your questions one by one, Mr. Ryan, to answer. Okay, uh, we have a question here from Mebu who's asking uh, how long uh, will a disinfectant be uh, valid? I guess he's asking how long 
the disinfectant will be able to uh, be effective after application. And uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ang as well is asking, is, uh, Mr. Tan Lung An Ang is asking as well, um, what is the efficacy of such disinfections, disinfectants, or how long can the chemical stay effective? Uh, because he's saying that uh, there are some uh, brands or, or people are claiming that these treatments can last for up to a year. So uh, what is your opinion on this? Okay, most chemical disinfectants can, once it's being disinfected and wiped down, it probably lasts as long as that only, right? Um, although bleach, you can last for 24 hours. And it really is not ideal to have the chemical disinfectant to have such a long residues time, you see. Um, if a chemical it has such a long residues time, it, it is actually quite toxic to humans. And we do not want that. Okay. And I suppose um, to, in answer to Mr. Ang's questions, um, there are certain disinfectant services that says it will last one year. It's most likely not chemical based, but a um, physical nanomaterial. Okay. Again, I've touched on the nanomaterial. There's very little known on the long-term effect of exposing oneself to the nanomaterial. And those that claim to have last one year are usually like nano titanium dioxide spray that does not break down, okay? And what environmental impact it has on the environment, right? the immediate environment you're exposed to. Is it safe to expose yourself constantly with these uh, chemicals, okay? Um, personally, not personally, but uh, US EPA does not endorse these chemicals. Right? There's very little convincing data that um, they, will, they will remain antiviral during the course of one year. Okay, there's very little data to say that. So um, they can claim what they ever to claim, that, but they need to show the data that it is still remain uh, antimicrobial and antiviral at the end of one year. Okay, uh, thank you, Ryan. Okay, um, so I think there's only one last question in, in there uh, in the Q&A. Um, so this, uh, Mr. Faisal is asking uh, on normally how frequent uh, should uh, we sanitize or disinfect an area or a place? So he's asking about the frequency of disinfection that is recommended? Uh, as frequently as possible, right? Um, Again, uh, you should focus if you have a lot of foot traffic and human traffic in a place, you should really um, focus on high touch areas. You need to, you need to sanitize as uh, frequently as possible, right? Um, also, because you can't avoid the high touch areas, how to protect yourself is to frequently wash your hands and sanitize your hands because your hands will tend to touch your face unconsciously, subconsciously you will just touch it, right? So um, my answer is as frequently as possible. I know it's a pain, uh, but it's in the best interest of everybody. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I think someone was asking about microfiber materials, but I think you've already answered that prior. Um, so that's all I have for today. Uh, wait, hang on, I have a few more questions to come in. Okay, uh, Miss Aina is asking, uh, you customers usually want warranty for disinfection efficacy. So what should we prepare when, uh, when a customer asks about, about that? It is very hard to give warranty because how are they, how are we going to give warranty to, to customers, right? Because the biggest contaminant is human, right? Once you clean the surface and unless you're going to do like what the pharmaceutical companies do, you're going to swap the surface and go and incubate and uh, try to see is there any bacterial growth or not. How are you going to do that, right? Um, 
humans is, are the biggest contaminant, right? Once you once you disinfect uh, an area and humans come in again, they bring all types of germs and viruses, not only COVID but cold viruses, right? How are you going to warranty that it's germ free? Right. The only thing I can think of is going to swap a surface and incubate and show that there's no growth of bacteria in the lab, which is impractical. Um, you, you need to um, use a registered product, a reputable one, right? So at least you know you are doing the right thing. Um, can I assist uh, in this question as well? So, um, according to this uh, warranty, our wise uh, industry do not give a warranty. Like what Mr. Uh, Ryan has uh, mentioned, it is absolutely true. You want to show the effectiveness of your job, you should talk to your customer to go for uh, swap uh, testing. So swap testing also, you have uh, two types. You need to tell them if they are willing to pay you for this amount of money, just go ahead. You can only do before and after treatment. So first is maybe you swap bacteria count. It's very general, one thing. Second thing is if they want to know coronavirus, you need to ask the laboratory to go in details type of species of the virus of bacteria. That's another charges. So you need to explain to the client before and after cost, which has to be uh, paid by the client. So definitely uh, before and after treatment, there will be a result after that. That is the thing that you can only already them and show them how good is your service. And it's not after one or two hours, things like that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Karen. All right. Uh, we have uh, a question here about frequency of, uh, conducting this infection, but I think that's already been answered by you. Uh, it all depends on the amount of human traffic and all that and high touch areas, right? So, uh, Mr. Kainis, I hope that answers your question. Uh, we'll move on to another question by uh, uh, a Fazila, who's asking, uh, is there a Malaysian standard for disinfectants that we can follow? Yeah. Um. Unfortunately, there's no Malaysian standard for disinfectant. I wish there is, right? So you can read out all those uh, fly-by-night companies. Um, usually, even for MOH, they look up to US EPA for guidance on disinfectants. Okay. Um, perhaps in the near future, we could lobby for a Malaysian standard for disinfectants, right? And it is in my interest to do that as well, right? But currently there is no standards. And if there, if there ever were a standards, they will closely follow the US EPA standards or European EN standards. Okay, <clears throat> okay, thank you, Ryan. Okay, uh, we have uh, a few more questions here. So uh, Mr. Muhammad Hasib is asking, uh, with regards to nano-based disinfectants, uh, what are the side effects for long term on human, uh, especially in high touch point areas or places where uh, touch, a regular touch occurs? As I touched before, um, nano added disinfectants, um, it is an area of uh, concern for the environmentalists, right? Because nano material act differently than their normal non nano material, okay? Um, some nanomaterials are antimicrobial uh, properties, but there is very little study in the long-term effects. That's why US EPA and in Europe does not issue any guidance on using nanomaterial on human, right? For disinfections or anything. Because the long-term effect is going to take 20 to 30 years of close studies to understand what's going on, what will, what will happen to your body if they're exposed continuously to nanomaterials. It is a very little understood area. Okay, uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, okay, we have a, another question here from uh, Mr. Aziz. Uh, he's asking that he, he read in a research journal about silver nitride uh, and that the residual effects of, of, 
uh, the silver nitride based products last for 30 days. Uh, is that correct? Uh, and also he's asking, there are a few products in the market which has a mixture of hydrogen peroxide and silver ion. Uh, what is your advice? So I think it's, I think it's a two part question. Maybe you can answer the first part first about silver nitride. And then the second um, part- Research I've, I've read about these products. Um, um, silver nitride is actually a very cheap material, right? Uh, first of all, if it's not mixed properly, uh, it will cause some uh, darkish spots on your surfaces if you not spray properly or mix properly. Um, does it have any effects uh, for 30 days? It depends on how evenly you spray your, your, your surface, okay? Uh, silver is an anti, has antimicrobial um, properties, okay? Um, the few research I've read is um, it doesn't seem to have any better efficacy than using pure hydrogen peroxide. The silver ion seems to only stabilize the chemistry, right? It does not add on um, the antimicrobial properties. Maybe because hydrogen peroxide is already a very good um, uh, disinfectant already, right? Okay, uh, thank you, Ryan. Okay, everyone. Uh, uh, if we do not have any more questions, uh, we will be... Oh wait, someone just posted a question. Um, okay, we are going to limit the questions because we are running uh, 17 minutes ahead of, uh, over schedule. So in, uh, in the interest of everyone's time, uh, I think we'll keep the, this last, we, this will be the last question uh, by Miss Aina, okay? So, um, wait a minute, how come it's coming up again? Although this is the same question about the warranty period one, which uh, Karen has answered already. Um, so I guess we'll close uh, today's uh, session right now, just with a final word from for, for the next upcoming training. So to everyone, uh, there will be two more training sessions that will be coming up. Uh, the second last one is tomorrow, which will be on the topic, controlling microbial growth by disinfestation and sanitization. Um, so for, for in the interest of uh, efficiency of getting all, the, all of you guys to be registered and to be able to attend the session, uh, after discussion with the MPMA, uh, we have decided that uh, payments will only be made uh, when you want to collect your e-certificates. So the charges are the same as what was announced the last few weeks ago. Uh, it's RM50 for non-members who are based here in Malaysia, USD20 for per person for overseas participants. Uh, do take note that these charges are for each session that you attend um, when you want to collect your certificates. So for example, if you attended uh, the session two weeks ago and this session, that would mean a total of RM100 to get a certificate for each of the session, uh, or the two certificates you need, right? And uh, finally, we'll have uh, next week another final session to introduce uh, everyone to process NPD, which is free. So do sign up for that. Uh, the details will be in an email that will go out sometime tomorrow that has the links to all the registrations, uh, the registration form. Okay. So uh, thank you so much, Mr. Ryan from um, CPES uh, Technology. Uh, thank you so much. For, yeah. uh, and thank you everyone for making time to... Uh, really sit down and learn uh, about disinfection, uh, especially with regards to the various uh, methods and chemicals and all that that's available in the market. I'm sure this has been an informative session for everyone and that um, you will be able to do better and learn how we can uh, protect uh, the public, especially during this time of COVID-19. Okay, um, so thank you everyone. Um, thank so, you. Yeah, all right, okay. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, you may email me. Uh, the email will be, my email address will be in the uh, emails that go out tomorrow for all of you who attended. Um, so thank you, everyone, uh, and uh, have a good day. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.